Recently, the Indian media reported that Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo will hold a leadership summit in early September, and both sides may sign an important military agreement. The new acquisition and cross-servicing agreement will take the Indo-Pacific concept to a new milestone, and is expected to further deepen the defense cooperation between the two countries. Although neither have directly stated which country they are targeting, the frequent activities of Chinese troops in the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait over the past two months, as well as the fatal clash at the Sino-Indian border in mid-May, have led to many interpretations that Japan's proximity to India is intended to counterbalance China. In terms of geo strategy, Japan and India's cooperation will envelop China from the east and south. And these two countries also stand in the way of China to the Pacific Ocean or the Indian Ocean. The latter being the only way for China to enter the Persian Gulf, according to the July 6th National Interest article, Beijing has been actively extending its influence to Africa and the Middle East, including establishing friendly diplomatic relations with Persian Gulf states such as Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, which led to their abstention from the controversial United Nations Security Council resolution in China's favor. China has long planned to establish permanent military bases in the Persian Gulf to weaken U.S. influence in the region. For instance, China established a military base in 2017 in Nigeria, Djibouti, which is located only a few miles from a U.S. military base. In July, China signed a 25-year comprehensive cooperation agreement with Iran. BBC cites the agreement as saying that China and Iran will enhance military cooperation, including military experience exchanges, joint military exercises, weapon development, and intelligence sharing. In exchange, China will enjoy a 25-year sustainable supply of crude oil from Iran, but the oil that will serve as an important strategic commodity inevitably has to travel from the Persian Gulf through the Indian Ocean, the Malacca Strait, the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, and the East China Sea in order to reach China. In 2014, when China proposed the One Belt One Road strategy, it included strategic planning for these seas as well, including the Malacca Strait, where China described it as the maritime lifeline. Since 2008, China has sent more than 30 convoys into the Indian Ocean via the South China Sea and Malacca Strait for anti-piracy reasons, with submarines accompanying them. In the South China Sea, China not only has territorial disputes with many countries, but also has frequent conflicts. In April, the U.S. aircraft carrier USS Roosevelt, which was on an operation of freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, ceased its mission due to the spread of the COVID-19 outbreak. Immediately afterwards, China announced the establishment of administrative zones in the disputed Nansha and Perisal Islands. Pointing radar guns at the Philippine Navy, sparking a serious protest in the Philippines. China also sank a Vietnamese fishing vessel and sent the Navy to inspect Malaysian waters, prompting multiple protests from the Southeast Asian countries. But China responded with an unyielding wolf warrior attitude. Seashell Islands, Nansha Islands are China's foreign territory. I want to emphasize that, regardless of whether any country is in any manner. 妄图否定中国在南海的主权和权益，强化其非法主张，都是无效的，注定不会得逞。Greg Poling, director of the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, says China's intimidation has never been news, but Southeast Asian neighbors are reacting more aggressively than ever. In addition to being overwhelmed by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is at least partly China's fault, this is why China is eager to expand its influence on the Persian Gulf. Its relations with Southeast Asian countries have deteriorated, and they are now reluctant to cooperate with China in developing natural gas fields. Even though the Philippines has previously agreed to cooperate in a project, it has yet to sign a formal agreement. China is seeking a more stable supply of strategic resources and to expand its military influence in the Middle East to counter the United States. However, Japan's alliance with India may thwart China's plans. In the past, 
The Malabar exercises were conducted only between the U.S. and India near the Andaman Islands. After Japan joined in 2015, it was elevated to trilateral exercises, which now take place annually in the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans. On July 25, the United States, Japan, and Australia conducted joint military exercises in the South China Sea and the Philippine Sea, during which Australian naval forces were surrounded and confronted by Chinese naval forces in non-Chinese waters or disputed waters. Australia's representative to the United Nations, Mitch Fifield, submitted a statement objecting to Beijing's assertion of sovereignty in the South China Sea. Saying that China has no legal basis to do so, and that Beijing has since launched a media attack on Australia and an anti-dumping investigation into Australia's red wine trade. The Indian Economic Times reported on August 19th that, in addition to ACSA, Japan, India, and Australia will launch the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, or SCRI, and hold their first Trade and Commerce Ministers meeting next week. This was one of the themes of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Independence Day speech on August 15th, when he said that global businesses have begun to look to India as a possible supply chain hub, and now India must manufacture for the world as well. For now, China is still Asia's largest manufacturing nation, but China's intellectual property theft is a serious issue over these years. SCRI comes at a time when countries are pushing for companies and manufacturing bases to move out of China. India is offering a 6.5 billion dollars incentive package to attract manufacturers from China to relocate their production lines to India and loosening regulations on foreign direct investment. Japan's Prime Minister has also set up a 2 billion dollars fund to help Japanese companies pull out of China in July. On July 28, U.S. Defense Secretary Mike Esper, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Australian Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, and Australian Defense Minister Linda Reynolds held a two-plus-two dialogue at the U.S. State Department. Our two great democracies face immediate crises like the COVID-19 pandemic and longer-term challenges like the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions. We need to deal with each of these challenges simultaneously. At Osmin today, we discussed and reached agreement on a wide range of issues. We agreed it's essential that the alliance remains well positioned to respond to both the immediate impacts of COVID-19 as well as the long, longer-term economic and security challenges that have emerged not just in the past six months but in recent years. Afterwards, the U.S. and Australia also issued a joint statement, vowing to cooperate with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the Five Eyes, and designated South Korea as a partner. Reynolds also said the two countries agreed to further deepen cooperation in defense, science, technology, and industry, including supersonic weapons, electronic warfare, and space warfare capabilities. These are key forces that can penetrate China's anti-Axis area denial weapons systems. Media also reported that Australia may be invited to join the annual Mirabar exercise as part of the Quad Alliance with the U.S., Japan, and India. It appears that new alliances have emerged in the Indo-Pacific region. These democratic countries are uniting against China's increasing threat.